they've been assaulted in jail. They're there uh, wrongfully. They are having to stay there because they don't have money. We don't have money for a real attorney. And since they're in jail in a county like Marion County, if they were in jail in one of the other 92 counties, it was very small. Uh, some of the best lawyers in town would be public defenders, but because they're in uh, a county like Marion County with a contiguous area of about 1.5 million people, public defenders are probably overworked, <laughs> understaffed, and they may not be the best lawyers in the first place. And so a whole lot of pleading to what you have not done occurs in those instances. So the fact that a group worked together to, to get the mayor and the prosecutor and others to cease and desist and say we won't pursue, and particularly private prisons that have mandates that they have to be 80% full, which means that the city got to go out and arrest a whole bunch of people, rightfully or wrongfully, uh, in order to keep those mandates for private prison, which is an asinine, uh, uh, asinine concept. Prisons and, and the judicial system is supposed to be corrective over against punitive. And uh, when you put the profit motives in there, all of that gets blown out of the water. The point is, we did not know when to clap. Uh, and we did not know when to clap, mainly because um, we have a strange disconnection between the ones that we say we're serving and what his mandate was and, uh, and what our own traditions are. And I always say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. What would Jesus applaud for? What did Jesus think was important? Why was, what, what was Jesus' mission here? And should we not be on the same page? Should we not even call Jesus? We have iPhones and we have all these devices. Can't, shouldn't we call Jesus and say, oh, by the way, uh, I've given my life to you. Uh, I want to know more about you and, and about your direction and about what you think is important uh, so that I can follow you because by the way the word Christian means followers of Christ and I want to know where you're going so I can follow you uh, yet in so many uh, uh, religious circles the church is, is, is the worst impediment to finding Jesus Christ because the church don't know Jesus and we are as Jesus said you can you uh, traverse land and sea to find a proselyte and when you get him he's twofold more the child of hell than you uh, because you have your own uh, you're using religion versus relationship and so uh, there were a group that I was asked to speak to because they were spiritual leaders uh, but they had a, a kind of a, a, a avoidance of really doing the work of Christ there is church work and then there's the work of the church and if you get them conflicted you'll mess up so i was asked to speak and i use uh, this sunday which is in the middle of martin luther king jr and we're all out here talking about mlk day mlk day and we're using christ and and uh, sometimes you can just use words but not understand their import or their meaning. And I was trying to get to the, 
the nexus of connecting the work of Dr. King, uh, the work of Jesus Christ, uh, and the work of the church. When Jesus says in the Matthean version, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. My, my professor taught me that that was in the accusative case in the Greek. And that meant that the one that was taking the action were the gates. The church was assaulting the gates of hell. Um, and so I, I shared this when I was asked. I entitled it, Living Your Resume. And by the way, the book of Acts is really part two of one letter, Luke Acts. And the word actually means praxis. And we're so concerned with uh, creeds, uh, but Christ is not as concerned with creeds as he is with actions. So I'm saying living your resume. And uh, the scripture suggested is Luke, the fourth chapter in the 18th to the 21st verse. Uh, the New uh, International Version reads thus, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me uh, to proclaim good news to poor people. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom for the prisoner and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the New Testament and the, the, the King James Version said and he closed the book he brought closure he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them today this scripture is fulfilled uh, the Septuagint leads us to Isaiah uh, 61, 1 through 2. He borrows this from Trito Isaiah. I said, uh, Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to all who are under my voice today. I would like to discuss very briefly a problem that we have in our community where the historic caregivers and shepherds and, and some of our religionists and some of the best and brightest practicing ministerial, ministerial and philosophic minds think it not good, godly or holy to go into certain aspects of the lives of the people of this great community. And I will start out by reminding all of us and each of us that the Matthean Great Commission with its operative word go is not the great suggestion, but it is the Great Commission. And therefore we are compelled by necessity to go. For as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said about Rosa Parks sitting on that bus in 1955 and thereabouts, that she was compelled by necessity or the Zeitgeist moment. The spirit of the, of the right time set on her so that she could not get up. Rosa couldn't get up because the spirit set on her. First of all, let me just say that in my humble opinion, there's an artificial dichotomy that is often bandied about in religion and in theology and in uh, philosophy and in life between what is called the division between sacred and secular. I know that the fundamental distinction of these are first representative. For example, the word sacred is, is, is meant connectedness with God or gods are dedicated to a religious purpose and so deserving veneration. And then what is meant by the secular has an emphasis of denoting attitudes and activities and other things that have no religious or spiritual basis. 
In other words, there's an antithetical arrangement. These things are not symbiotic, but they are antithetical. Uh, it means not subject to or bound by religious rule. Let me hurry to say that my issue today is not with these terms or not even with the polemical nature of these two terms when placed side by side. Yes, let me hurry to say that they are distinct and that these two terms are both distinguished and distant one from the other. My issue is not even with the idea of defining these terms, or else how could we even have an, in, uh, an intelligent conversation about them? No, my issue is how the world of philosophy, the world of sociology, the world of politics, the world of theology, and yes, even the ecclesiastical world, Yes, that's right. The church itself have brought wholly into what I now call the dangerous, erroneous, limiting, debilitating, parochial, myopic, and false labeling of what is sacred and what is secular. Allow me to give an example of what I am trying to convey. The Bible is wont to speak of a special day to commemorate the occasion when the God self was finished with his labor in the creation narrative. Six days, the text says, he created, but the seventh day he rested. And thus, he called that day the Sabbath, or Sabbath. The scripture advised further to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But did this mean that every other day was secular? If so, why would the scripture say about another day? Monday or Tuesday, and which is clearly not Sabbath, and for that matter, all other days of the week other than Sabbath, why, this, why did the scripture say something powerful, something profound, when it recorded these words? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Apostle Paul to the Roman church put it this way in Romans 14 and 6, American Standard Version. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord. He that eateth, eateth unto the Lord. For he giveth, uh, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not unto the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. No, ma'am, and no, sir, I submit that any day that one is regarded as due to the lordship of God as creator, preserver, monitor of that day. That day is sacred. And please know that this is not a speculative argument in search of a problem. The point is when people start relegating the holy, the profound, the sacred into small, puny, diminutive little boxes and spaces they put an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent presence, uh, ubiquitous, all-pervasive, immense God in a tiny box. And he doesn't fit there. God doesn't fit in your boxes. God will not be packaged in your boxes. In a whole week, there are seven days and 24 hours in each day. This means that... Uh, that there are 168 hours in a week. We give God only one day out of the seven and only one hour and a half out of that day. So the score is the sacred, what you call sacred, gets one hour and 30 minutes out of 168 hours versus the secular get 166 and a half hours out of 168 hours. Uh, so God gets one hour and 30 minutes. You go figure. The one that made the whole day, the whole week, only gets an hour. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and furthermore, this principle does not only apply to days and weeks and seconds and hours. It apparently has found its truth in the very ground that you walk on. For Psalms 24 and 1 says... Don't get it twisted. It's not in the text. Don't, 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 you have to look at it and say, to it. don't get it twisted. I don't, it's not in the text. I, I, mm, okay. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a particular 
eisegesis. I, I, I read that in the, I'll, I'll take it out just so it won't be confused. Here, here's what it says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the sea and stepped itself upon, upon the flood. What a profound and powerful pronouncement. Yes, and consider further that even the most undesirable place has a sacred element to it. The most undesirable place on earth has a sacred and profound element to it. Recall the occasion of the call narrative of the prophet Moses when he finally said, I will turn aside and see this bush burning, but it is not being consumed. It was then that the God himself said, take off your shoes. Why would I take off my shoes? on the backside of a desert, out here in this ungodly, God-forsaken place. And God said, oh, I haven't forsaken it. Take off your shoes. Why, Lord? Because the ground that you're standing on is holy. Yes, even arid, barren, dusty, parched, moistureless, thirsty, unspirited, non-wet, dry as a bone, backside of the des desert, was described by no less than God himself as holy. And the new prophet was told to take off your shoes. I thank God for the African-American church and for the fathers of the black church that is and have been in my life, some of whom are in this very room today, sainted ones. Others have gone on to be with the Lord, men like James Edison Tyson, George Hall, Andrew J. Brown, Moselle Sanders, Bishop Ozra Thurston Jones from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Holy Temple Church of God in Christ, Elder James Rush, who gave me the following quote, uh, Bishop Jones gave me the following quote about the incident of the call narrative of Moses. Earth is crammed with heaven, and every bush is ablaze with God, but only he or she that seeds take off their shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blueberries. I thank God for the example of uh, Elder James Rush, who showed me that sermons are best seen and not heard. I, I thank God for uh, the Reverend Moselle Sanders would say to me, boy, that's it, my name wasn't Lionel, it was boy. Yes, that was not, uh, what he called, yes, that was my name to him, not elder, not doctor, not bishop, not even Lionel, just boy. Then he would say, I'm going to train you different because half these preachers know everything about first century uh, Jerusalem and the phrase in the Aramaic and the Greek and the Hebraic, but they can't tell their own members how to get to the trustee office or how to get their children back in school when they've been wrongfully put out. Not you, you're going to know something. You're going to know how to deal with God's people right down here on earth. I thank God for Andrew J. Brown. And he would just say uh, things like uh, this when people uh, miss the sacredness of those who resided in the underbelly of life. Well, he can speak in tongues, but he can't say hello. Or he can walk in broadcloth, but he can't walk with people in sackcloth. And if you really got on his bad side, he would just say one of my favorite. He said, may the good Lord take a liking to you. I remember one day when he was uh, conducting a funeral at Stuart Mortuary. And I went there, didn't even know the people. I went in support of my mentor, Dr. Andrew Brown. And he was in, he, he was, the, the service was not at St. John's where he pastored. It was there. And I went there and I, I stood in the back and he began to speak. And he said, and with boot marks concern and Hegel's dialectics and down through the valley of Jehoshaphat over against and dealing with eschaton and, and my goodness, I, I, I got lost. And I couldn't hardly wait for the film to be over. As the funeral was over, uh, I saw him out in the aisle, I went to him and rushed him and said, Dr. Brown, I'm here for you, but what were you talking about? And he said, shuckins, boy, I was tiptoeing to the tulip. That Negro wasn't saved. Well, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, 
Uh, so he had no time. He had no time for people that wasn't serious about God. So on the occasion of Jesus' trial sermon, he went into the synagogue in his hometown, and as was the custom, the leader of the synagogue would read the obligatory text from Torah. Then he would turn to one of the attendees and honor them by allowing them to read the text of their choice. To read the alternative text or the text of their choice. It may have been something that had been marinating in that person. But they chose the text, which would not have been in the liturgical calendar. On this day, in this occasion, the attendee that was chosen to read the scroll was named Jesus Christ, who was now both uh, 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 fresh from his own baptism and fresh from a tort round of being tempted by Satan himself. It is so interesting that Jesus chose as the text. He would read from Trito Isaiah. Interesting for the following three reasons. First, he has scoured all of the scripture. Even at 12, his mother and earthly father had to come back and his re as he left them uh, to have an intensive session of theology. And uh, when they, uh, they left him for three days and came back and said, uh, we've been worried about you. And he said, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? So he has scoured the Torah and priestly codes, the Halakha and Agedictic Catechizer, the Decalogue et al and have passed on all of these, and now he had arrived at the perfect theme or the perfect thematic motif for his ministry. In other words, he found his resume. Most people develop a resume uh, 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 that has in it the history of what they have done. But this resume was a projection of what he would do. Uh, it was, if you would, a... Uh, a projection of what he would do, a feasibility study. It was a plan, it was a foundational plan, it was a strategic document. And he said, uh, uh, in, uh, this is my resume. In other words, he found his, his rise and detra, his reason, his purpose, his responsibility for his life and for his life work. And Jesus found all of this in this text. And number two, what he read called for both articulation and action. The person of Jesus and the passion of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus could not nor would not allow for a life, a ministry, a vocation, or an avocation that just talked about it. With Jesus, the Christ, the mantra really was, don't just talk about it, be about it. Yes, Jesus was credo, but Jesus was also credible. Jesus was a proto-rabbi, but Jesus was also profoundly uh, rambunctious in getting things straightened out. Therefore, Jesus said with the ancient prophet Isaiah, the Numa of Adonaiah is upon me and has Mishak, Malshak, me to proclaim good news to poor people. Uh, but that is not all. That same spirit has called me to set at liberty them that are bruised. Uh, this is my issue. If we don't know what we're supposed to do, if we don't know what success looks like, you can have it and not know it. And you can lose it and not even understand that you had it. And you don't know what to rejoice about. You are like a ship without a sail. So the same spirit called him to set at liberty them that are bruised. And so when he saw people set at liberty, then Jesus got happy. We get happy when we see a certain person on the B3 organ. But Jesus got happy when he saw the, uh, people set at liberty who had once bruised when he uh, came to bind up broken hearts, to open blinded eyes. In other words, to work wholeheartedly to bring healing to the whole person political healing, social healing, mental healing, mind healing, poor or holistic healing, soma, numa, and psychic healing. Jesus was saying then, and he is saying to each of us today, that it is a false dichotomy to save the soul, 
and to leave the body in hell, sick, destitute, vanquished in schools to prison pipelines and fodder for the Wall Street run uh, private prison industry. What Jesus was really saying was my ministry to seek to save to the uttermost a uh, uh, whole entire cell eugenic versus pathogenic full impact salvific total salvation and finally number three he closed the book it's important to know that the book is closed it's important to know that we don't need an addendum to the motion it's important that we don't need to set the motion aside the book is closed it's over it's important to know that there's no more adjudication so uh, adjudication so this does not need to go through the circuit court and up to the Court of Appeals and up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme One has spoken and the book is closed. And so Isaiah 4 and 8 and 21, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight, to set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord, and he closed the book. My brothers and my sisters, let us agree with the Lord Jesus on this matter and let us agree with the reason that Moses had to take off his shoes in respect to the arid, worthless ground. And the reason is that God was there. Uh, yes, God was there then and God is in zip code. 46201 and 46226 and 46218 right here in the so-called at-risk zip code he is right here now yes I know that the crime rates of some of these areas suggest I know what those areas what it suggests but God is there God is on the corner where the vice lords of the G's are hanging out God is in the mild square from Monument Circle where there are hardly no black businesses where there seemed to be an invisible sign that says to our eternal shame, read Blackie and run. And if you can't read, run anyhow. God is there in our economics and our politics that is so filled with disparity <coughs> for the black church attendees. He is there and he is waiting on us to get there and to speak the truth to the ruthless and to say and demand, let God's people go. Brothers and sisters, the word politics from come, come from the latin word for people we cannot get out of politics god is there in government and in politics and this and his people are there inextricably there why do you think you call him the king of kings and the lord of lords why do you think that that uh, that it is written that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess god's authority and god's sway is over every kingdom, over every political power. God doesn't ride the donkey or he doesn't ride the elephant, but he's king of king. And the only reason that God will not be there is because he has sent you and I, and we have decided that there's something sacred and something secular, and we ain't going to do the secular because that would be beneath God. And we've decided that erroneously, that's sick thinking, stinking thinking and oh not on god's agenda we are the salt of the earth and are the priests and the prophets to the nation plural god is already there to deliver his people but he is waiting on the ones he has called to go tell pharaoh to let his people go and if there is a place that needs a touch or that needs healing or that needs uplift and you think that god is not there then just do two things first remember that jesus himself have said the whole need not a physician, but them that are sick. So anywhere you see sickness, know that you are already appointed. Jesus said, I came not to fix the fixed up. I came not to call the righteous one, but I came to call them that are sick, them that are hurting, them that are bruised. And second, and I am finished, if there is a political milieu, a social venue, an ecclesiastical environment that you think God is not there, then you go. You go because there is the ministry of presence. You do know that there is the ministry of presence. And when you show up, God will show up. You go and the God that is in you will permeate, uh, perpetuate, sanctify, satisfy, lift up, transmogrify that place, that condition, that environment. And when we do this, when you and I together do this 
thing when the black church reaches back into its own historicity sounded forth the trumpet that shall never, 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 never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul to answer. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the ways. He is wisdom to the mighty. He is honor to the brave. So the world shall be as put to and the soul of wrong is slave. Our God is marching on. So glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. This is what I prayed about when I was asked to share. That is what the Holy Spirit gave me, that we must move past a false dichotomy we must not surrender this world to Satan in any of his manifestation. Our community belongs to God. Our children belongs to God. Dr. King said there is a special place in hell for those who sat on the sideline in days of crisis. Said politics asked the question differently. The conscious asked the question, is it right? What is right? And so my dear brothers and sisters, as we uh, observe MLK Day and the contributions, when I go down to our church, to the Church of God in Christ in Memphis, I almost always go to the L Lorraine Hotel. The last time I was there is the first time ever did I go across where the shot was supposed to come from. As I took that tour, Usually when I get to the Rain, Rain Hotel, I go from the bottom and I work my way all the way through there. It takes me two, three, four, five, six, seven hours. Um, and I'm all the way up to room 306. And I look at the brick, <coughs> the brick where Dr. King supposedly lay slain. But this last time I went over to the building where the shot allegedly ring from and they took me to a, a bathroom and I got over in the tub and I looked out the window where the alleged assailant uh, fired the shot that hit the right cheekbone tore out his tie damaged his neck severed his neck, gaping hole, 601, shot rang out, some food somewhere. I think, I think he was there for the sanitation workers, but I think a year before then, on April the 30th when he gave the speech against Vietnam. He gave the sermon actually in Ebenezer. I went to that church to talk to that pastor. I saw the bullet holes where the assailant shot and killed his mother. Talked to the people in the neighborhood. Went to his house. Went upstairs to his bedroom. Listen to his primal moment. He's making tea one day. He said he got scared. But he heard something in the teapot. He heard a voice that said, Hallelujah. He said, I'm with you. He gave him strength through the bombing of his house.
So when God gives you purpose and a vision and a mission, God empowers you. That shot rang out to kill the dreamer. Mother Doris, you can, you can, you can, you can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. Can't kill the dream. And I'll take it up every, every time. Sometimes when you shoot the dreamer, you release the dream. Mm -hmm. And um, a very special man. I, I studied King and Gandhi. Gandhi was a lawyer that wanted to be an ethicist and religionist. And King would later confess, I don't know how I could escape being a preacher. My daddy was a preacher, my brothers was a preacher, my uncles was a preacher, everybody around me was a preacher. But King wanted to be a, a lawyer. Some say he wanted to be a doctor. And he wasn't really over enthusiastic at all about the fundamentalism and emotionalism of the Black Baptist Church. Certainly wouldn't have been about the Black Pentecostal Church. Something, God made him so that something else had to move him. Um, thank God for praising all of his form. But whenever Paul talks about glory you know what real glory is? Glory is the glory of the peach tree is not the photo of the tree, but it's the peaches it produces. We use a phrase, he cursed him out. In God's terms, Cursing is not saying you SOB or you MF. That word meant, F U C K really meant for unlawful carnal knowledge. That's what that word meant. But real cursing is what Jesus did when he would pass the fig tree and say, No one will eat from you forever. So to curse means. To identify the purpose for which a thing exists and to say it will never have that purpose again. That's a curse. To bless is found in the first chapter of Genesis. And he or she shall be like a tree, I'm getting happy now, planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in season and whatever he doeth shall prosper. His leaves shall not wither. That's blessing. Blessing is always tied to the accomplishment of purpose for which you exist. Cursing is always tied to the annihilation of the purpose for which you exist. And the worst form of cursing is to have you to continue to exist existentially but never fulfill the purpose for which you exist. To have a heart that won't beat. To have a mind that won't think. You're cursed. You're fundamentally cursed. And so the shot could not destroy the, the dream no more than the cross could destroy the Christ. Because the cross exists on Friday. Help me say, but oh, wait till Sunday. Mm -hmm. Something, what, 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 what people did on Friday, God undid on Sunday. And so uh, that's the lesson that I wanted to share today. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen.